Good evening, everyone, everybody, and welcome to the Rare Book Room. My name is Irini, and I help direct events here at the Strand. For a little bit of history, Strand was founded in 1927 by the Bass family over on 4th Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled until after over 92 years, Strand is the sole survivor, still in the Bass family, still running 400 events a year, and still housing new and used books. Tonight, I'm thrilled to have with us New York Times bestselling author, Peggy Ornstein. Peggy is a contributing writer for New York Times Magazine and has been published in The Atlantic, The New Yorker, and other publications, and has contributed commentary to NPR's All Things Considered. She's the author of multiple books on issues affecting women and girls, and tonight she is releasing her newest book, Boys and Sex. Joining Peggy tonight is National Magazine Award winner, Rebecca Traster. Rebecca is a writer at large for New York Magazine and a writer about women in politics, media, and entertainment for The New Republic, The Nation, The New York Times, and The Washington Post. She is the author of the award-winning Big Girls Don't Cry and New York Times bestseller All the Single Ladies and last year's Good and Mad. Please welcome, please join me in welcoming them both to the Strand. Are you on? Are you on? Peggy is not on. Mic on. You want to try now? No mic. No mic. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Peggy. I feel like I'm like getting. <laughs> I know. I feel like a little. Like a little kid in a big yeah, on my like Edith Ann. Like this. Remember Edith Ann? <laughs> yeah. Hi. Hi. Wait, before we start, I have to tell you guys my strand story because I just have to, and because I see Lisa, my friend Lisa here. Um, when I was first starting out, when I was 21 years old, I just graduated college. I moved to New York, and um, I had a job at Esquire that was so lowly that we weren't, we didn't even have a title. We were called staff, like an infection, <laughs> and. We got paid $13,000 a year, which was not enough even then to live in New York. And so what we would do is um, the book person who was the book review editor at Esquire, who was sitting right there, um, would uh, put the books for that, the review copies that she would get that she didn't want out on a table. And we would all leap on them like vultures and stow them under our desk. And then on Fridays, we would take big bags down to the Strand. And they were called books to go down. I don't know if they still do that. And we would go to the basement, and they would buy them for 25% of the cover price. And that was how we made ends meet. And so there is a real sweetness for me to come back here some, um, actually makes me a little teary, 30 years later as um, a writer of one of the books that I hope nobody is taking down and selling for 25% of the price. <laughs> so, I just needed to say that. Um, I want to ask you how you came to write this book that you hope nobody is taking down <laughs> to the Strand. Um, because you have written for decades at this point about girls girls and sex cinderella ate my daughter um your you know this has been girls have been the subject that you have been thinking about writing about you are a girl you have a girl um the first sentence of this book is like i never thought i'd write about boys nope. so what was the path that brought you to writing about boys? It was not on my to-do list, that is for sure. Well, you know, after I published Girls and Sex, everywhere that I went, people in places like this would say, when are you going to write about boys? When are you going to write about boys? And I think, oh, somebody else's job. Um, because I just, I didn't, for one thing, I didn't think boys would talk, you know? They don't have a reputation for chattiness. Um, and I thought I would have long transcripts that consisted of, uh-huh, you know? <laughs> um, and, and I started thinking about it, um, and realizing that nobody was talking to boys. And as I was thinking about that, um, the Me Too revelations began. And suddenly, um, you know, the, the kind of breadth of sexual misconduct across every sector of society became apparent. Um, and it, was, it became imperative that we do something to reduce sexual violence. But it also felt to me like an opportunity to engage boys in conversations about sex and intimacy and gender dynamics and masculinity in a way that 
had never be before been done. Mm -hmm. So I set out, so you know, it, suddenly I was really excited about it. And, and it, just to be clear, it hasn't really been done in a big pop no. context, has it? Which is surprising to me. Like, did you, when you sort of turned to look at the other writing on this subject, was have well there there's a lot of academic stuff right but yeah no there's not and i think um i mean there's some on masculinity but and and that was the other reason why i wanted to do it was i felt like i had already been spending so much time in the um trenches of the social lives and sexual lives of young people that i knew the terrain really well mm -hmm. um and i had the connections and the trust of a lot of young people already who could help me um make the transition to writing from from, from writing about girls to writing about boys um, I think I want to start with a question about pleasure. Because reading this book, and so much in this book that you're describing about the ways that we communicate um, with our kids, with, with, our, with sons about sex, about the kinds of messages they're getting from pop culture, about how they communicate with each other, um, uh, with the women and men that they're having sex with or want to be having sex with, the apps, the, the sort of technological side. Um, so little of it to me seems to, reading this book, I, I kept thinking like, where's the pleasure? Where's the yeah. feeling good? And the thing that made me sort of endlessly sad reading the book, it's a, it's, don't worry, it's like a real upper, <laughs> but like the thing that, the thing that I kept thinking about is like, the disservice that's happening here is that we're taking this thing, sex, and robbing the people who are thinking about it, want to be having it, are having it, of the very physical pleasures of it. Not just the people that boys are having sex with, but the boys themselves. Yeah, it was surprising, really, how disconnected. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, they were saying, well, it felt good, but it didn't feel good. Or, or, or one boy said, it's like two people having really, he was talking about hookups. He had, it was a f second semester college freshman, and had hooked up with 10 girls and had intercourse with five. And he said, you know, it's like two people having very distinct experiences and there's not a lot of eye contact and you don't sit, you know, not a lot of conversation. And um, it's like you're, I, I loved this. I felt it summed up so much of the hookup culture. It's like you're acting vulnerable without being vulnerable mm -hmm. with somebody that you don't know very well or care about. And he said, it's not like it's a problem for me exactly, <laughs> but you know, it, it's weird and it's not fun. It's not really, even really very fun. This question of vulnerability and the effort to not experience it or mm -hmm. not show it, evident even in the like, not that it's a problem for me. Yeah. Right? And you write in the book about boys sort of force teaching themselves not to cry, um, the sort of modeling of, of male silence by fathers. Um, and then also the language of violence around how boys are taught to talk about yeah. sex all seem to come down to this issue of dehumanization, of actually not being human. Yeah, well, it, the vulnerability, I really feel that vulnerability is at the very heart of this book. And boys struggle, I mean, there's all these different things I'm talking about, but there's this like centerpiece of boys struggling with vulnerability, with not being vulnerable, vulnerable, denying vulnerability, rejecting vulnerability, embracing vulnerability, apologizing for vulnerability. And it's part of, you know, how, how boys learn to become men is they would talk about, um, you know, as one guy said, I'm allowed anger and happiness. Um, and they would often talk about putting a wall up and putting all those feelings behind this wall or, you know, I trained myself not to feel was a really common refrain. Mm -hmm. Or, I trained myself not to cry. There's the boy that, uh, when his parents got divorced, wanted to cry and uh, couldn't, so he streamed three movies about the Holocaust back to back, and, mm -hmm. you know, that worked. Um, but when we cut boys off from, I, I felt like with, with girls and sex, so much of the centerpiece of it was writing about the ways bo girls were disconnected from their bodies. And in boys and sex, it's about how boys are disconnected from their hearts. and when they're con disconnected from vulnerability, we know, first of all, emotional vulnerability is a fundamental human you know, need and, and central to your well-being. And it's also the cornerstone of, relation, of good relationships. Brene Brown says it's the secret sauce that holds relationships together. So when we don't allow vulnerability in boys, we cut them off from the capacity to have that kind of relationship. And we also then, that affects the people that they have their relationships with. Right. 
there's there's the impossibility of connection between two people who aren't able to be fully human. Yeah. And, and as you were saying, you know, so what the, how they learn, you know, the language, the public language that boys are supposed to learn to, to use around sex is, you know, they hammer, they nail, they pound, they bang, they hit that, they tap that, they pipe. You know, it's like they went to a construction site, yeah. not <laughs> engaged in intimacy. Um, a lot of that, of course, and you, you write about this at length, is coming from porn. And I think that there's one thing um, that really strikes me, having not myself watched a lot of contemporary porn, and, and Peggy encourages parents to go and watch some go of the porn it, dude. Mm -hmm. to figure out what's out there. Because as I learned from this book, it is not the like Ron Jeremy porn of the 80s with which I am most familiar. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is, can you talk a little bit well, about what's changed? Yeah. So, I mean, there's all kinds of porn, right? There's feminist porn, there's queer porn, there's ethical porn. That tends to be behind a paywall. Um, the porn that kids most readily access, uh, which is at their fingertips because of the internet, because of smartphones, um, because of uh, the dropping of the paywall by Pornhub, basically, which went online at 2000, in 2007 and was a game changer this way, um, meant that they can see anything, obviously, you know, that you can imagine and a lot of things you don't want to imagine right there on their phones. Um, and, you know, curiosity about sex is natural. Masturbation, yay. You know, really good, really important. But what's changed is that because of that, um, boys are uh, learning their, their they, they could barely, they could not really imagine masturbating without it was the thing. Mm. And they were, from the time they, this generation had been in puberty, they had linked that cycle of um, desire, arousal, and release to porn. So that one of the guys said to me that on his crew team, there was a guy, he said, who was legendary um, because he had stopped using porn. And, um, and they said, well, wh what do you do? And he s said, I use my imagination. And they said, whoa, <laughs> how do you do that? You know, like it was, inconce it was l truly inconceivable. And the trouble, again, it's not sex, but that the kind of porn that they access for free easily online and repeatedly is a, is a kind of porn that distorts sexuality and often shows sex as something men do to women and women's pleasure as a um, performance for men and distorted bodies and you know lack of connection, all the, all the things that we know. So it's really important with our kids. I, I just don't think that we have the luxury of not discussing this with mm -hmm. them anymore. Um, and we have to talk to them about what's real and what's not real about those images and what's missing from those images. And the, and the irony, some of the, uh, again, some of the sadness is in, you write about the sort of age at which people start to see porn and have their their um, arousal triggers shaped by yeah. what they're seeing to the point where it affects their ability to, in some cases, enjoy actual sex. Well, which yeah, there's some which research is, on that. It's, yeah. It makes me anxious because you don't. There, there's so much um, to be critical of porn is not to be anti-porn. Right. As you're, as but we're talking about kids. Right. And we're talking about and 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 I think that one of the one of the things to talk about is the difference between something that's highly arousing. Mm -hmm. and something that's pleasurable, you know, to, to start understanding those things in your head as a young person, because some of what they were seeing was highly arousing, but they didn't really necessarily like it or want it. But, you know, you look down and, and your body's reacting right. to it. And so kind of understanding that dynamic, dynamic is really important. But I also feel like, you know, we do talk a lot about porn. Everybody always asks me about porn. Um, but the messages that they're getting from the mainstream media are, are just as significant and can be just as distorted. And I feel like one thing I really took away from doing this work was with girls, after writing about girls for 25 years, you know, we have done a pretty good job, not perfect, but a pretty good job of recognizing that the messages the media sends out to girls are harmful. Right? I mean, I think everybody pretty much agrees that you know, it reduces them to their bodies, it presents fe you know, female sexual availability all the time in submission, and we do a, a pretty good job of talking to girls, cultivating media literacy in girls. There's entire organizations devoted to that. But boys are growing up in that same environment and more. 
and we don't say anything to them about it. We never talk to them about critiquing. And even little things, like I was thinking um, when, when my daughter was little and we would, well, we didn't really watch Disney movies, but we, you know, something like that, that I would say, look, honey, her, her eyes are bigger than her wrist. <laughs> are your eyes bigger than your wrist? Is your head bigger than your waist? Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't think I would have said that if I had a boy. I don't think I would have thought to develop a, a lens in my son so that he could see the tricks that the media was playing on him and resist them as he got to be older. So I, I really think that's someplace we can step in and, and, and help our boys with. One of the things that I found interesting about the book is that in, in writing about straight boys, um, you were often describing men who had trouble having intimate or vulnerable relationships with the women that they were having sex with or wanted to be having sex with. But at the same time, young men who were hungering for the emotional intimacy that they, or any kind of vulnerability that they actually found in their relationships with women, including like conversationally with you, yeah. Like the, I mean, w one of the things you describe is this the sort of sense of relief a lot of these guys yeah. seem to get in being asked about themselves, these kinds of conversations that nobody's had with them, and being able to tell their stories in a way that were, they weren't going to be judged and that they were kind of hungrier for it and sometimes were contacting you of their own volition. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it made, but also... They can be kind of pushy about it sometimes. <laughs> Are you going to interview me? When are you going to interview me? Do you need to interview me again? And I'd be like, no, <laughs> I'm done, thanks. <laughs> there were, but there were other sort of examples of like I can't I, the kid who um, wanted to work with girls like boys who wanted to prefer sort of being in in classes with oh, girls yeah. and working on projects with girls because there was a kind of emotional p potential for emotional exchange and I'm wondering about that both things being true at once that there's a kind of hunger for that connection with women and for conversation and revelation yeah. and all that. And yet there's such a difficulty in reproducing it within their romantic or sexual relationship. Interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, anything for, for these boys, anything can become a masculinity issue. You know, I mean, there's, there's research that shows that guys are less likely to recycle when they've been, if they feel that they're, you know, there's been something, they do something that threatens their masculinity in the study, I don't know what, and then, and then they don't want to recycle because they see recycling as being feminine. <laughs> You know, and that would threaten. I swear, you can look it up. You can Google it. It's crazy. Um, so they're very vulnerable to that, and so that's why that boy said like he didn't want to um, uh, uh, work. He like preferred working on projects with girls, and that's where the whole idea of um, l all the the slurs against gay, you know, fag, that's so gay, no homo. That's kind of where that comes in. And what was really interesting about that was that the boys, the straight boys that I would talk to, would say, "Well, I would never say that to a gay person." I have a gay, you know, I have gay friends. They would never call an actual gay person the F word, you know, but they called each other that because it was a way to like draw the lines of the man box and to police what went on inside it. And CJ Pasco, who's a um, sociologist on the West Coast, did a study, I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing my hashtag, did a study of hashtag no homo on um, Twitter and found that the way that guys used it wasn't as a, as, a, as a gay slur, but as something that would allow them, would be a shield so that they could express really normal human emotions about affection and you know they'd say things like i miss you man we should get together hashtag no homo you know it's something that just allowed them to be human um and and could shield them from that so that th i got off your point but um but but yeah it was about vulnerability and 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 again and how hard that was for guys and how they use different language and such to do that and also that female friends and and mothers particularly um were a place where they could be more vulnerable and it was i really started thinking there's a really a small thing in the book but i think it's really important about mothers and how boys when they would confide um they tended to confide in a mother and i think that that feels really good, you know, to have that relationship with your son and to feel that your son can express that vulnerability with you. But the trap of it is that if you process your son's emotions for him, rather than helping him learn to process them himself, you're reinforcing that idea that women are there to do men's emotional labor. Mm. And I think that most of us women know as adults that that becomes problematic um, in our relationships <laughs> with men when we're older. <laughs> Um, so I think it, it, it's, it's super important, especially if you have little boys, to start, you know, to, one way to combat all this stuff is to help them 
name and understand their emotions. So to say, you know, the, you, it, it seems like you feel really sad right now, or it seems, you know, that seems really frustrating because otherwise, boys, they get anger reinforced all the time. Mm. And so all those emotions that are in that bucket end up going to anger. And that's the only thing they're allowed to express. And so sometimes even when your son is acting really angry, to take a step back and go, okay, what is under that anger? That under that anger is sadness. Under that anger is fear. Under that anger is something else. And helping them broaden their emotional range, I think, is a fundamental way that we can help um, both support our boys and prepare them to better be in the kinds of relationships and be the kind of men that we want them to be. I'm curious about um, not just the modeling and talking about the emotions, but the work of sex education from a parental standpoint. How does that, how did you find that's typically being communicated? It's what? not. No, even less with boys than with girls. I think uh, the, I, I said a study that said the average length of the conversation that boys get from their parents about sex is 10 minutes. Mm. Um, which like, if you think like, what if it was table manners? You know, like, can you imagine having you saying, okay, um, I would, you know, make sure you use your napkin and your fork and say please and thank you and excuse yourself when you leave the table. Okay, never having that conversation again. Parenting um, could be, parenting could be so brief. You know, I mean, you I just know. have like a 10 minute seminar and everything. And I then we're know, done. I, we're that's done. You're you remember done. that, um, right? You're but but what boys tended to have heard was, of course, don't get somebody pregnant, don't, you know, but what they often heard was respect women. That was what their parent, the, the message that they got from their parents. And you know what one guy said to me is like, I don't know what that means. Like, that's like telling somebody don't run over any little old ladies and handing them the car keys. You know, <laughs> you don't think you're going to run over any little old ladies, but you still don't know how to drive. Right. Right. You know, so it's really it's 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 um, very limited what they're getting. They're not getting it from parents. They're not obviously getting it from schools because you know abstinence only. Um, so that's why, again, you know, media, porn, and each other are the, are the main sex educators. And it's really hard for me to believe that we would be that cavalier about any other topic that's so essential to our kids' well-being for the rest of their lives. And how, in the boys that you spoke to, how does that kind of inability to talk about something, how is it even further complicated when the boys are queer, or trans. Oh, I thought you were going to say drunk. Um, <laughs> well, we can, we can talk about that, that. that too. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, there were a couple things that were really interesting about gay boys in particular. Um, one, that in terms of how it rela they related to straight, uh, just in relation to straight people, that gay boys were just were really models of how to negotiate consent and the parameters of a, of a sexual relationship, um, partly because they had to be, you know, because it's not... They're, they don't have the same script. It's not obvious who is going to do what with whom, and you have to have a conversation about it. And one um, boy said to me, you know, I, I don't know why straight guys are so resistant to this conversation, because if we're having this conversation, it means we're going to have sex. I'm like, that's great, you know? <laughs> um, so that, and, and Dan Savage, who you probably all know, he's a sex columnist, um, writes um, that about the four uh, magic words that gay men use at the moment of consent, which are, what are you into? Mm -hmm. And it puts, you know, it's a great kind of open-ended question that, that rules everything in or everything out, but isn't what so often happens in heterosexual pairings where it's a set of prescribed questions that one person is asking and the other person is agreeing or disagreeing to. Mm -hmm. Now, a caveat on that. I was thinking about this after I talked to Dan. Dan's a gay man, and I think think if you had that, if, if a guy asked a heterosexual girl that question, and this re is why it's a symbiotic thing, girls and sex, boys and sex, she would say, I have no idea. You know? So I think that there's that. And that's a whole different book. Um, but the concept I like very much. So that's part A. Part B was a concern I had about gay boys, especially in the age of swipe apps, that, you know, it's a totally different world. They have grown up in a totally different world than the one we grew up in. You know, e e even if you're 30, you know, like it, it, gay marriage is like we've got a gay guy running for president. You know, I mean, it's it's a new day, and there was a way that all of that was a like there was a social queerness. Like it was okay to be the gay best friend. It was okay to be the theater boy. It was okay to be the queer eye. But nobody was talking to gay boys about sex. 
And so what was happening was they were still going on the down low and going onto Grindr, lying about their age, and having um, uh, anonymous hookups with much older men. And that really concerned me. I heard that a number of times. And I would say, you know, like, if you were a girl, I would kind of have to report you. Why would you think I wouldn't have to do that if you were a guy, you know? And they would say, yeah, not ideal. And so it, it really became clear to me that especially those of us who are heterosexual and have gay kids, we have to be more educated ourselves about what constitutes a mutually gratifying um, sexual relationship between two people of the same, who have the same body parts and, uh, and talk to our kids, um, you know, get over it and start talking to our kids about that aspect of their lives just as we should straight kids. And what's more, this is the third rail of sex education is, is including the LGBTQ plus perspective in it. But if we don't, then not only are those kids left, you know, unaddressed, but other kids are left continuing to marginalize um, those kids. And so it's, it's, it's super important to start integrating I mean, it's it's a pipe dream that that would be integrated into sex education. I realize, <laughs> and you're but still you know, an abstinence only for the, I know, right. but in my world, um, you know, it, it would be something that isn't siloed off as being something that's just about um, LGBTQ plus kids, but is about everybody. Right. Um, you know, I know that you've. This is the second pub day was yesterday. Yeah. But uh, but you've already done a lot of press and you've done a couple of events. Uh -huh. um, this is number two. Okay, so maybe, okay, maybe the question is premature. Yeah. But <laughs> um, when you write a book that is sort of, it's not that it's provocative, it's that it's, it's material that we haven't like talked about like in the press with any sort of curiosity or have you been surprised at all so far in like what, now that people are looking, reading, hearing, having a chance like to talk about this stuff, have you been at all surprised by what people are, focusing on in the book? I've been surprised by how truly hungry people seem to be for it. Um, and that feels great. I mean, you can never know that that's going to happen when, when you write a book. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that there's anything, honestly, that... I mean, people people are latching onto the same things that I latched onto. Right, <laughs> so, right. So yeah, no, I, I I I don't think there's anything that 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 has really surprised me, except that people ask a lot if I felt um, like I needed to advise or or mentor the boys that I interviewed, um, mm. because you know because they are they talk so honestly and so candidly, and it's so clear that they've never talked to anybody before, and. And so many of them said, you know, it was therapeutic, or uh, I've never said these things to anybody. And um, in one case, I was, um, I, I did a, um, I went to a freshman pregame party, as one does <laughs> in middle age, um, <laughs> because that's not at all awkward. <laughs> and, and then the next day, I went back after the, the kids had gone to a, the frat party without me, thank God. Um, and. Uh, and we sat down and talked, and we were talking about hookup culture. And we were talking about um, we were talking about the morning after text, which is like such a thing. And you know, looking at it from adult perspective, I'm like, wow, it's a text, man. And they're like, well, you have to figure out like you know when you send it and how you know how long you wait and whether you do Y O U or U, and it's oh. like totally fraught. And I'm just like, and then this well, a friend of mine's son read the book and said that part like completely resonated with him because just the night before he'd been sitting on his bed staring at his phone thinking, oh my god, what am I going to write this girl? And then he finally just gave up because he couldn't do it. And so anyway, we're having this whole conversation, and at the end about hookup culture and stuff, the kids go, can we do this again next week? And I said, sure, but I'm not going to be here. You know, I don't live in the dorm. Um, <laughs> But it was, you know, it was clear to me that they really needed to talk. But I felt that my job was not, you know, it would be inappropriate for me to, um, you know, advise them or or to try to, you know, perform therapy on them because I am a journalist. Um, so, but I felt like just creating this space where they could talk and and work through their ideas in a way that they never had before and safely was offering them so much. And I kept thinking, what if I am a total stranger? 
you know, what if they could do this with people in their lives? Mm. And that is ultimately what I wanted the book to do, was to give you know, parents the opportunity to hear what was in guys' heads so that they could think about those conversations and also boys themselves so that maybe they could open up a more meaningful dialogue with one another and, you know, within their own heads. That story, like so much else in this book, and that story is such a mild example of it because, like, texting's great. I love texting. There's nothing wrong with texting. But so much of this book led me to think over every page of this book. <laughs> Don't give my child a phone. <laughs> yes. Every page of We were of this talking book about this earlier. Like, <laughs> we were talking about, like, no phone, no phone, no phone, ne <laughs> never a phone, no phone. Um, but, but for two reasons, both because of the sort of potential harm of the technology, right? Um, whether it's the swipe apps or the sort of, like, again, texting is really the mild stuff, or the porn or whatever becomes accessible. But also because the, oh God, I sound like such a Luddite or like a technophobe and I really don't want to be. But, but also the sort of loss of like human, like the talking in the dorm, the, if, you can, if you can communicate in a, you know, with each other and send each other material and have all your communications mediated via a machine, there's not either the in-person or the vocal and aural um, intimacy. Well, yeah, they talk about that in, the, in that yeah. discussion of the text. They talk about how the problem is, is that you don't know when somebody says something that you can't, there's no affect and you can't, I'm, I'm looking at my, this is my Palm Pilot, remember those? <laughs> um, you know, the, and, and, and you don't know, like, you know, they're talking about, like, you can't sometimes tell if somebody's trying to open something up or shut it down. And, that, yeah, that's hard. That, that, yeah, well, but it's 20. What am I going to say? I it's know. Like, this is the, this I'm is, sorry. This is a futile We're a grown up, and it's, a, and, and it's, it's troubling to us. I, I, I right. can't, I don't know what to say about that. Right. Um, I do want to, I want to, um, I want my last question to end on a positive note. Yeah. <laughs> um, because I think there is, there's actually a, a real positive um, in this book. And you touched on it in the very beginning. Um, which is that you see an opportunity yeah. here, a huge opportunity. And especially within the context of um, a, a global new conversation around sexual power dynamics and harassment and assault, whenever we think about that conversation, I find too often when we talk or think about that conversation and the impact it might have on boys and men, it's cast as ultimately punitive or dangerous for them and the thing one of the things i love about this book is that you see it as an opportunity yeah. to make everybody's lives better yeah absolutely and and we really haven't talked about assault which is i kind of, i mean i feel like so often what when we talk to boys we talk about that to them about what we don't want and what they shouldn't be and you know all of that, and and there's this opportunity to me is partly talking about the, to talking to them about what we do want, what they can be, and what they want to be, um, because they really were the boys that I talked to. Most of them really did want to be, you know, the men that we imagine they can be, and so how can we help them get there? And just like girls, I feel like when you know, like 25 years ago when I started writing about girls, I was looking at and continue to look at this fundamental contradiction between you know, all the new things that we've told them they can have and be and do, and all the old stuff that we hadn't let go of at all. And that girls were struggling under this weight of this contradiction. And, you know, for 25 years we've been talking about that. And again, things aren't perfect, but they're better, and we're more aware. Um, I think it's time to bring boys into that conversation and recognize the contradictions that they are laboring under and the ways that we have held them in a certain, you know, the, whatever you want to call it, the mask of masculinity, the man box, whatever you want to call it, toxic masculinity, precarious masculinity, it's got so many names now. Um, but we have, we have still, we still have those expectations of them. Not only, they, it's not just that they have those expectations themselves. They rightly will say like, well, if I, you know, if I act like a more vulnerable guy, Girls aren't gonna like me. Girls like assholes. Girls like jerks. You know, like it's a, it's a dynamic, and we that we need to talk to all our kids about. Um, but yeah, it it just seemed like they wanted, they were hungry for more guidance, and they were hungry for more pathways and more expansion of what it meant to be a guy and behave like a guy and be you know sexual and be emotionally attached to somebody and live in this world as a full human being. So we can do it. We can do that for them.
do we want to, do we want to start with? <laughs> so I'm just like looking around the room and seeing the people I went to high school with and went to college with and stuff. This is like intense. <laughs> Does anyone who went to high school with Peggy want to start by asking the first question? Um, <laughs> or middle school? There's people that, junior high we used to call these people. Right? Westwood <laughs> in the house. Mm -hmm. um, do, do we want to, do, do people have questions that we want to, okay. Uh, we'll start here. You can. Where is she? She's gonna. Oh, she's, she's gonna, gonna come around with a mic. Yes, there's two mics floating around. Just wait for us. Um, I am wondering how, if at all, the straight boys talked about girls' pleasure. Um, good question. Good question. So it depended on the context. In a hookup, they would say, "Didn't care too much." They would say, "I know it's bad, but I don't care." Um, in a relationship. They cared. And that's really interesting because it meant that when you think it through in an intellectual way, that guys were using orgasm as a measure of value of the woman that they were with. They were withholding orgasm as a single signal of disregard um, or the activities that would produce it. Um, so that was very interesting. Um, they also had a confusion at a very basic level, especially the younger guys, high school guys, early college guys, of what, they weren't unconcerned with female satisfaction, but they didn't define it through orgasm. They defined it through, uh, their, through stamina, their stamina and penis size. Um, and their concern, you know, in a hookup, the hookup is not about the two people involved so much. It tends to be about the invisible audience in the room and what the story you're gonna go back and tell your friends. Um, and so, you want to make sure as a guy that she's going to go back and tell her friends that you lasted long enough in that, in that encounter. Um, so, you know, like one guy said to me that one of the boys in his high school, uh, some girl, you know, said that they were, you know, the nickname said he was Minute, his name was Max, Minute Max. And, you know, he became, all the boys became terrified that they would be Minute Max. You know, you don't want to be that guy till high school. But, you know, what, what they would say was you basically, um, like one guy who was older now and, and had kind of worked this through, um, but he said when he first started uh, um, his sexual experience that he would look at the clock before he had intercourse and try to see, like, okay, I have to last this long. And then when he lasted that long, like, can I go a minute longer? And he said it wasn't about her pleasure, really. It was really about that story that he knew she was going to go back and tell her friends. And he wanted to make sure that her friends all thought, you know, that, that everybody was cool, with, that he was okay, that he was the right kind of guy. And he said, you know, he said, the thing is, is that it turned, ta turned sex for me when I was younger into kind of a task, one that I enjoyed, you know, to a certain extent, but one that I was always kind of not in, uh, he said, I was, I was not in the moment. I was always, you know, uh, slightly outside thinking, is this enough? Is this enough? Is this enough? So, yeah, glasses person, yes. Um, I'm liking that you're both here because this sort of relates to both of your work, but um, some of the reporting I'm hearing in the Me Too era is about um, uh, people that say that they thought it was mutual, the abuse, uh, and I wondered if you had determined any origins of that? Yeah, that's a great question. So actually the whole last chapter of the book is about a story about um, two, uh, I, don't, I can't call them a couple, that would be inappropriate, um, a pair, pair? yeah, um, Anwin and Samir, um, who uh, have what he thinks is an awkward hookup and what she, uh, what is assault. Um, and Th and it's it, and and I'm looking. I, I really struggled in the assault discussion over what I might be able to add to that conversation um, that might give some more dimension or some more food for thought about how we can address this um, in the current in on campuses particularly. And a lot of the girls that I used to talk to would say they they didn't necessarily want a guy expelled. They didn't necessarily want him suspended. And I don't think we can expel or suspend our way out of this anyway. Uh, ideally, people would have education before this happens, but um, they wanted the person to understand the harm they'd done, to hear the pain they'd caused, and not to, move, uh, not to do it again. And so that brought me to looking at more of a restorative justice framework, which allows for that um, 
recognition of harm done and discussion of what of, of the needs created by that harm and how those needs can be addressed. Um, and, it, and it keeps a lot more control too with the um, person who's been harmed, with the, with the survivor of that assault. So this, this is the long way around of saying this, th these two people, it's like a four year story of him recognizing, whoops, that wasn't an awkward hookup. Whoops, I actually assaulted somebody. Oh my God, I'm the worst human being on the planet. I should you know, just go jump off a cliff because of course there are only monsters and good guys, right? right? We can't, and, and this insistence that you know, everybody who assaults is a monster and only monsters assault blinds us to the reality of the potential for coercion and sexual misconduct among good guys. Um, and, and what do we do when that happens? How do we reckon with that? How can they take accountability for that? So this story is so much about how this boy um, who starts out being sort of a, you know, he says he was educated by Van Wilder and born and, you know, really excited to go be in his frat and hook up with as many girls as possible. And you're very kind of typical in that way. And how he like just has this amazing transformative arc. Um, and, and in a way I was kind of tempted to think he was a unicorn, um, but, um, He's so ordinary where he starts out that his ability to finally, I think through this process, look in the eyes of his behavior and change it um, is really remarkable. And what we know in a lot of research is that guys tend to over, especially when they're drunk, and this is back to the alcohol issue, over perceive yes, um, not hear no, not be able to see a, par a partner's hesitation. Uh, and the whole idea that what you're supposed to do is, you know, as, as Samir felt, you're supposed to, as a guy, just be pushing forward. And that's why, in a lot of ways, to me, I don't know how you feel about this, but to me, um, some of the most interesting allegations in the Me Too revelations were um, the Aziz Ansari story. Mm -hmm. um, n n and, you know, putting aside the fact of the irresponsibility of the reporting of that story for a minute, um, which is real, um, it was because it wasn't about legality. Right. It was about ethics. And it, was, and it revealed the most ordinary of power dynamics in gender, which is a guy who is just over eager, wants what he wants, puts male pleasure before female feelings, a girl who's hesitant, he doesn't see it, and you know, he's just an over eager dude who sees girls' limits as a challenge that he's supposed to get over. Um, and I think that that story, the crucible of that story, is a really interesting one to sort of disentangle with both boys and girls. I'm, I'm so glad that you asked that question. I'm gonna respond briefly yeah, too, yeah. because actually the pair of these books, Boys and Sex and Girls and Sex, I think are so important to the answer to that question because as somebody who's written so much about Me Too, one of my deep frustrations is with the simultaneous value of individual stories. Right? If we didn't have the individual stories of, in many cases, monstrosity, real, like real monstrosity, in many cases, ambiguous harm, right? If we didn't have those stories, we wouldn't be able to be having the conversation. But then too often we fall back on those individual stories to comfort ourselves and tell ourselves if we can just rid ourselves of our monsters and yeah. come up with an easy answer to the ambiguity, we will have fixed the problem. When we know that what we need is massive systemic change. And that's, systemic change is incredibly hard and daunting and it's very easy to feel depressed when you think about what it would take to actually change the way that we think about and act and, and make our systems, make, make the structures. And so when it comes to workplace harassment, the idea of systemic change involves actually redistributing all kinds of forms of power and, and professional authority before we can begin to address the ubiquity of sexual harassment in the workplace. When it comes to sexualized harm, this is why these books, and it's so interesting because what Peggy does in both these books is she relies on individual anecdote in exactly this way to illuminate, to get us to be able to see and have these conversations and recognize recognize, oh, I know that story, I know that kid, I know that. But what she's doing is arguing that we need an overhaul in order to fix these problems. It's not just, and it's so obvious when it's about kids and teenagers, that if you just like, I don't know, changed the brain and took away the phone of whichever this guy is, things, right, that we know that wouldn't change anything. And so what what she's laying out here is in fact a way we need to approach these larger questions around harassment and assault, which is that it's not about individual like punitive solutions. It's one of the reasons like, you know, I, 
I don't want to go down this path. I'm but just like, gonna. No, I'm, I'm just gonna take you with me everywhere I go, <laughs> so you can. No, you can but just do I, that. I'm but so it is why. I mean, that is why I. The last chapter of of the book. It was it's, it was an interesting thing for me in the last chapter. I I normally, you know. I'm a journalist and I like to purport and I like to show rather than tell. That's the first thing you learn when, you know, that's the rule you learn in creative writing class when you're 15 years old, show, don't tell. And so that's how I've always approached solution-oriented chapters. Um, and I kept trying with this book to do that, to go into some classroom, to go into some program, to, you know, uh, profile an individual. And I, it kept falling flat. And I realized that after nine years of writing about adolescence and sexuality, that I actually had things to say. And so in this book, I step out behind, from behind the curtain. And I can't give you a script. You know, I can't do that. I don't know your kid. But um, I give at least a template of the range and kind of conversations that we need to have with young men, and a lot of them with young women as well. A lot of these conversations would go for anybody or anybody in between those things. Um, and uh, the, in, in order to um, make that systemic change and in order to raise people who are you know, more fully capable of connection and reduce sexual viol sexualized violence and objectification. And I do think that the way that we read these books, that we come to these books as readers when you open this up and, and, and you read them, if we could apply the same, we, I, I find as a reader the reactions that I have to this are we need to change, we, we need to change how we think, we need to change how we see the people in our families, we need to change what we ask of our partners, we need to change, if we could apply that same sense, like because it is, it's actually addressing many of the very same problems as when we read about instances of sexual assault and, and everything along the spectrum to ambiguous harm, but a, an easier interpretation is this can be fixed on an individual basis, and you wouldn't, you just don't naturally, you don't think See, that I'm, here. I'm tricky because I write about kids, and it is, you're right, and I, th I, I think, you know, I, and it's my hope, I mean, I, you, the kids are our hope for the future. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, th and, and I think we also are raising a generation that is really different than, the, than our generation, and they really do want to make a lot of these changes um, and see us as, you know, tremendously fusty and binary and old-fashioned. Um, so there is, a, you know, I think really great opportunity, uh, like we've been saying, for making um, significant systemic change that will be, that will be just, and we have made significant, in some ways, huge, significant systemic change for girls. We really have. I mean, huge compared to 25 years ago. And some around sexuality, right? Yeah. So some of what I read in this book, th it, there's a lot of hard stuff in boys and sex about the message that are still being sent. And in fact, that have ramped up probably in response to yeah. feminist messages Backlash about empowerment kind of thinks, and yeah. reciprocality and equality and all of that. And this sort of abusive ramp up of other kinds of messages. And that's hard. But at the same time, there's so much in here about other kinds of progress that's been yeah. made in terms of acceptance and and diversity of identity and the, well, and all the boys I could say, like even the you know not to over stereotype, but the the football player at the Big Ten college started talking to me about toxic masculinity, and I was like, dude, really, you know that that phrase? And he's like, everybody knows that, you know. And, and when you I wouldn't have them, expected that. When you ask them, how do they identify? Oh, you yeah. say, even, the, even <laughs> that football guy offers his pronouns. His pronouns. They all offer their pronouns immediately. And I wasn't asking that, actually. Um, <laughs> so, you know, there, there is a lot that they, they are a new generation. They are different. They are um, more fluid and, and more open. And we can use that and leverage that to, um, to, make, to make much greater change. But we, you wanna, do we have another oh, yeah. we, Should we ask another question? Yes, in the back. Yeah. So maybe this is in the last chapter, I haven't read it yet, but um, specifically, you guys talked earlier, uh, and the beginning of the book talks about um, the sort of negative consequences of emotional illiteracy in uh -huh. boys, Ooh, and good. I'm a high good school phrase. teacher, so I'm specifically thinking about high mm -hmm. school boys. Um, but my question was, and I was wondering if you could comment on the, the difficulty in addressing that in a, in a context where there's not just social consequences, but potentially a real threat of physical consequences yeah. for young men who, express, who, who are not conforming to more restrictive ideas about masculinity, yeah, where I it mean, is genuinely dangerous true. in many cases genuine to dangers. deviate from the norm. Yeah, and and they, how do you address that? Or how would one address that? I don't know. Um, <laughs> they, 
yes, boys would talk about that. And particularly, I mean, it was really interesting because even um, there was a, a gay guy that I talked to in San Francisco, um, you know, where could it be more friendly? And he had been in, you know, very seriously in the closet in high school because he feared um, social ostracism and physical harm. And he told me how he would, I used to say that, I sometimes say that gay boys were like the spies in the house of hypermasculinity because they n were the ones who really were aware because they were trying to put it, you know, to put the mask on that wasn't natural, even more unnatural to them. So he would talk about like looking in the mirror and you know, um, practicing his I'm the shit face or, and he said the one time that he blew it was at the first middle school dance and he was out on the dance floor dancing, having a really good time and one of his classmates came and said, you're dancing like a girl, you're using your hips too much and he was just like freaked because here he'd been trying to do everything right and this was something he was naturally inclined to do and it was a tell. And so he would watch other guys and figure it out. But I don't know, you know, to, to, to tell, to, to, to give you the solution to that, you know, I can't really do that, but I can say that I really feel that adult men um, are, are so important in how we address this and in giving the support and modeling and having the discussions with boys. And um, one of the things that was really clear among the guys was that they wanted adult men, their fathers or the adult role models in their lives, to um, talk to them more about sex and emotional intimacy and about their own regrets. Um, and I think it can be hard for adult men because nobody talked to you. Um, but that, and, and there's a sense that like, you gotta do it right, you gotta do it perfect. And you don't, you know, you don't have to be perfect, you don't have to have the perfect relationship, you don't have to know what to say in order to start that conversation. And another place that um, I think it can really be interrupted or, or generated um, is uh, in all male environments like sports teams. You know, the, the sports teams can be you know, a crucible of the worst kind of bro culture, or they can be a crucible of change. And there is a, um, a group called Coaching Boys into Men that, and, and maybe this is something to bring to your school, um, because it's free, it's online, and, and you can get trained in it. Uh, and they, it's a really light intervention, um, but it leverages the power of coaches who can have such an impact on young men's lives uh, to, and it, it, it's a kind of, it's a, it's like a weekly 10 minute discussion thing that the coaches do and they've done s studies on it where they've you know done control groups and the whole thing and discovered that it reduces um, sexual violence, that it increases bystander intervention, that it decreases the kind of language that guys use either about women or um, using feminized language to you know as a weapon against other boys. So I think that if I were to say, I can't give you a specific thing, but I would say that would be a great thing to look at. And also that um, by being a different kind of man in that environment and starting to have discussions or develop community among boys, um, you can start to make change in those environments. Yes. Hey Peggy, hello. Hey Peggy, Justine Fonte. Hi, nice to see you Good in person. You. Um, so I uh, wanted to give a comment and then a question for you. The comment being, um, uh, it, with, a, with a lot of social justice issues, the burden has often always been on the marginalized group to do the work. And so I want to first recognize and thank and acknowledge you for doing the work for what should have already been written by a man, and it hasn't happened yet, but thank you for doing so because if anyone has the capacity, it's you. Oh, well, thank That's you. One. <laughs> It's sad that this book hasn't yet been written and by someone in the group that is responsible for it. So thank you for doing that work. My question is, um, I imagine with all the data that you've collected, you weren't able to include every theme or um, trend in the book. Um, so of the nine chapters, I wanted to know what would have your 10th chapter been if you could have had more to write about or even the 11th and 12th mm. so that we can kind of get an exclusive deleted scenes version. Aren't you clever? <laughs> I mean, the truth is that when you know, once everything's on the cutting room floor, it's like it's dead to me. But um, <laughs> there was there was a story that I didn't get that I that I got cut off from that I would have loved to have pursued that I that I couldn't, um, which was a a boy who um, he was in a, a fraternity um, at an elite school, and he talked to me about his, how his frat was was different and these things didn't happen there, um, and then we met uh, we went we went drinking again, as one does in one's middle age with underage boys. Um, 
not awkward. Uh, and we went drinking, and he said, uh, he, with a friend, he and a friend and I went drinking, and they said, you, this was like a month later, and he said, you'd never believe what happened. Um, we had a party, and on the dance floor, one of the guys, one of the brothers, hit a girl. And they immediately disaffiliated him. And two weeks later, it happened again. And so then, the, and they were like a, you know, what they call, like a high upper tier, high status frat. The, the sorority that they tended to pair with, the officers of that sorority came and read to them, he was one of the officers in his frat, a, a list of all the things that had happened and all the things that had been, that the girls, all the, you know, ambiguous harm, assault, et cetera, et cetera, that had happened to the girls in that sorority that had been done by the boys in that frat. And he was devastated, just devastated. Like he, he, he was practically in tears, he said, when he heard this. And he said, you know, you know that some guys maybe aren't the greatest with girls, but you don't really realize what they're talking about. And so what he did was, um, he had was one of the rare guys that actually had, had a tremendously great sex education class in school. He went back to his sex ed teacher in high school, he talked to her, and he, de and he worked to develop a program to bring into his frat um, you know, the, uh, uh, sex education, pleasure education, um, anti-assault education. Again, not just the negative, but the positive. He was doing this really cool thing, and I thought this is one of these places where you could leverage that all-male group for, you know, to, to make change. And I said, can I follow you while you do that? And he said, sure. And then he went back to his brothers, and they were like, <laughs> no. Um, so I had to drop it. I didn't get to go through with it. Um, he did just, again, I spend a lot of time texting teenage boys, as one does. Um, <laughs> he texted me the other day, and because uh, uh, the book was coming out, and he and and he said, um, and I said, how did it, you know, how did it go? I hadn't talked to him for like a year, and he said um, he was still doing it, and it was kind of still going on, but it wasn't, you know, he it wasn't as much as he wanted, but he was, it, it would have been really cool. The, the, the answer to your question is, I really wanted to follow that through and see what the potential was and what the limits were and where maybe, you know, what we could maybe learn from that. And I wish I'd had that opportunity to do that. Sorry. It's not in there. It's also interesting because it's an example of a boy undertake exactly what she's talking yeah. about in terms of the responsibility being taken by the non-marginalized. Yeah. yeah, he was stepping up all over the place, this guy. It was great. Um, I don't know how well it worked. I don't know if it'll last, but it would have been a really interesting thing to, to watch that happen. And again, a way that I was trying, when I, I was struggling so hard to find another, another road into the discussion of sexual harm that hadn't already been gone over and gone over and gone over, um, that, that would allow boys, you know, a big issue with the boys, because a lot of them talked about times when they felt they'd crossed lines. And they didn't know how to take accountability for that. They might want to, but they didn't know how to. And there was no pathway for them to. And they worried that if they tried, that they would immediately be tagged as monsters and expelled from their communities. So this was sort of about how a boy was trying to help other boys take accountability. Um, and I would have loved to have been able to see that through more. Are we? Are we oh. Uh, OK. okay. <laughs> We can take a few more, a few more questions. Yeah. You, yes. Person with beard. The person who's looking away, yes. yes. I want to ask this. Oh, here's the microphone. Microphone is coming. I'm really glad you just made that point about that boy. And I'm really glad, Rebecca, you made the point about systemic issues. Because I want to ask this question. And I don't want my question in any way to suggest that I'm not completely cognizant of those systemic issues. But what I wanted to ask you is, did you come across any boys who seemed to be in a really healthy place in these issues. And the reason why I want to ask that is not to undercut at all the message. Yeah. It's just, did you learn anything interesting from them? Either was there anything surprising by that? Did you learn about how they got there? Did they suggest a healthy sexuality that was in any way indicative or surprising? You hadn't even thought of what healthy sexuality might be from a boy? Mm -hmm. Anything? Or was that the only boy you talked to who was like... No, 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 no. Place? There were others. They, I mean, they, they were all kind of wrestling with this. And the, one of my favorite guys in um, the book. I mean, he, f he started sort of in a bad experience. He had a, like, I was also texting him the other day. Um, and, and I was saying, you realize your worst hookup is about to be memorialized in 
forever <laughs> in a book. And he's like, yeah, ha ha, I hope the girl reads it. Um, but there are some boys whose, whose journey, and, and especially if they're sort of older, um, their journey towards healthy sexuality is, you know, you see the arc. And I think Samir actually, in that final chapter, um, although I'm, and, and I was writing also with him and with Anwen today, and saying I'm really sorry that, you know, she had to go through harm and trauma for him to get there. But at the same time, their story and his arc and where he come and, and how he learn, starts learning about what constitutes a mutu mutually gratifying, mutually pleasurable um, relationship uh, with somebody, whether it's for five minutes or 50 years, um, is remarkable. And he sort of gets to a place at the end where he's starting to um, try to educate other guys. And so he said, like, when my friends come home and say, you know, hey, I hooked up with her last night, I'll say, did she have a good time? What was it like for her? You know, and they'll go, what? And <laughs> she'll well, what did you talk about? How did you discuss the sex that you were going to have? And, and so, you know, th there were guys who were sort of thinking about new models and moving towards new models, for sure. Um, and, and yeah, they're in there, too. Let's do two more. Two more. One Let's more. do one more. Yes. I've been kind of going boy, girl, boy, girl. Or so there is actually a bill currently pending in the New York State Assembly and Senate, I believe, that would mandate comprehensive, medically accurate, um, consent-based sex education throughout the state of New York, K through 12. Consent-based or pleasure-based or both? Consent, mm -hmm. it seems, but it could go either way because it's still in the initial stages. From your perspective, what would the best or ideal curriculum look like? Not just from a substantive perspective, but also from a practical way to communicate that information it in a exists. successful way. Um, it exists. And is anybody here Unitarian? Yeah, you're Unitarian? You ever go through OWL? Yeah, so Our Whole Lives, the OWL curriculum, um, which is available for a um, fairly low fee online already, uh, is a great curriculum and it and it goes from um, what age like five I want to say to like 70 um, seriously it's, it's our whole lives um, and it was developed by the Unitarian Universalist Church and it is I keep always say it's a little bit of Holland in the United States because <laughs> Holland has the best sex ed in the world um, the, on my website actually I mean if you really want, seriously want the answer to this um, on my website there's a, a, a link to resources and then to like positive sexuality or something and I actually talk about it, uh, have a list of a few curricula that I think are um, models of uh, yes consent but pleasure based um, sex education ho holistic sex education Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you all for coming. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I just want to say that like, Rebecca is one of the writers that I admire most in the world. And her books and her articles have been, you know, are just foundational um, feminist writing and writing, period. Um, and, and thank you for doing this. That's very lovely.